Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the camera? Okay, I'm uh, Command Sergeant Major uh, Christopher K. Greca. I'm 31, about 31 years of service. Matter of fact, today is my very first day of being retired. So I came off terminal leave and hit the retired roles today. Um, I grew up in a military family. My father was uh, uh, an NCO who went to OCS about halfway through his career. He was a signal guy. Um, so I grew up kind of understanding, you know, I, or at least I thought I understood the military. Um, and I enlisted in 1986. And 31 years later, here I sit. Uh, I've been married to my wife for 28, 29 years, and I've got uh, three great boys. Okay, so what drove you to the Ranger lifestyle? Um, what drove me to the Ranger lifestyle? I was a young private in Korea in 1986, 87. Um, and I had a non-commissioned officer, Stanley Solace, who kept talking about this Ranger thing. And I'll be quite honest with you, as a young private in the United States Army, I had never heard of a U.S. Army Ranger or what it was. Um, but he was fairly insistent that that's where he believed, based off of what he had witnessed from me, uh, you know, over that particular year, that I needed to become an Airborne Ranger. So uh, I think he got me drunk one night. Uh, I think we drank some soju uh, over there in Korea. And, you know, this was in the days prior to typewriters and stuff. And he showed up with a document and he said, Private Greca signed this. And the next thing you know, I got orders to 2nd Ranger Battalion or 2nd of the 75th up at uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Really not even understanding at that time, other than going to airborne school, um, what the things I needed to do in order to get there, and uh, specifically the Ranger Indoctrination Program. I had no idea that was a required step or even, honestly, what it was. So uh, I still thank Stan Stanley Solace to this day. He ended up becoming a warrant officer in the SF community um, in retiring. But if it wouldn't have been for, uh, for Sergeant Solace and some of the other great leaders that I had over in Korea, um, I never would have taken that step. We're going to talk about that experience, because here you came from conventional forces. You came to RIP, a little bit different experience, maybe, you thought. You kind of... Yeah, he, he, okay. yeah, uh, he, uh, yeah, what was some of the challenges, uh, that you, you know, going into the Ranger community? First off, I had no idea about this thing called the Ranger Indoctrination Program. So I was in airborne school thinking, you know, upon completion of airborne school, I'm just going to zip up to this, you know, 2nd Ranger Battalion up at Fort Lewis, Washington, and I had to go to, to RIP. So um, I'll never forget the non-commissioned officer. You know, he was in his starch and shine, and he looked like a million bucks wearing that black beret at the time, the black beret for the Rangers. And he kept talking to me about, hey, on Friday, uh, you're going to show up to this thing called RIP. We started with 121 candidates and graduated 19. And I will tell you, you know, 30 plus years later or 30 years later, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Not, not only physically, but mentally, just the, the, the wear and tear um, of the things that we did over a short, you know, a brief three week period, um, really kind of led me into that lifestyle and make, started to, uh, uh, to make me realize what I was capable of doing. I don't think when I was over in Korea that uh, my leaders, uh, God bless them, great people, but I don't think they ever harnessed uh, all of my potential or capabilities over there. Um, and I started to realize um, what I was capable of going through RIP. I could run faster. I could do things mentally when I thought that the, you know, the clear-cut solution was to quit. Um, I figured out, you know, I can continue to push myself, not only for me, but for my Ranger buddies on my left and right. And I, you know, started figuring out how important the team was. It just wasn't about Greca. It was about me and my Ranger buddies. Yeah, yeah, the things that were very demanding about RIP and the things that were a little bit different. Um, the, n number one, it was clearly the physical activities. I had been pushed before, uh, you know, but the idea of rolling left and <laughs> rolling right, you know, and red square up top cardiac hill um, was just exhausting. It wasn't only exhausting, uh, again, physically, but mentally as well. So when we started off in that class, again, 121 candidates uh, show up. I'll never forget, I think it took the first candidate 
you know, maybe a couple, two, three, four hours before. And they would pull the same drill, by the way. Close your eyes. We'd be laying on our stomachs, typically out of the front leaning rest or doing some push-ups. And it was close your eyes. You know, who wants to quit? Well, we won't think less of you. We won't even let anybody else open their eyes. So you can do it unbeknownst. You know, your identity will be kept, uh, uh, you know, will be kept somewhat confidential. And, uh, you know, you could hear the shuffling of the feet. And I'll never forget that first shuffling of the feet. And once, you know, the first person quit, I've often said that quitting can be contagious. Um, and it's contagious uh, not only, uh, you know, on yourself for, for future references. In other words, once you quit once, I, I believe, it becomes much easier to quit. Um, but it becomes easier for your buddies to quit. And I, you know, I experienced that both in, not only in the Ranger Indoctrination Program, uh, but certainly Ranger School as well, as people would start to tap out, um, it would become easier for others to quit when they seen themselves. So physically it was demanding, you know, as fast as we were running, memorization, the Ranger Creed, you know, I had never been you know, put under a, a microscope where not only Ranger history, you know, you had to learn the lineage of, of the organization you were about to join. Um, so it was mental, it was physical, it was just kind of the complete pass, package, excuse me, of putting those stressors on you and simultaneously trying to help your Ranger buddies out. You know, they, they you know, beat it over our brain that, uh, you know, certainly you want to become an airborne ranger, but, you know, rangers, as in the plural, um, that's what this is truly all about. So um, it just became real, for lack of a better experience. Maybe my first year in the Army, maybe it wasn't real, uh, but certainly it became real uh, going through RIP and then subsequently being assigned to the 2nd and the 75th. What's some of your um, what's some of your difference with how would you defin uh, differentiate Ranger School and Ranger Regiment? Both both one's a leadership school producing. You go there, get the tab, you go back to your organization. Um, it's said to be a leadership school, where the Ranger Regiment produces leader in the organization. Can you kind of differentiate the two? And for those that don't know and understand the, the difference between the two. Um, organizations well we, we've all heard what is the difference between ranger school and you know serving in the ranger regiment we've often heard that the you know the school or the tab is a school and the scroll is a way of life um, but i believe uh, that they both ultimately have the same goal and objective and that is that ranger creed all right, and it's about those stanzas of the Ranger Creed. So certainly, you know, Ranger School from a, you know, a 60-day perspective is going to take a young man or a young woman, and they're going to teach them the basics and the fundamentals of patrolling and small unit leadership and tactics. Um, but, you know, simultaneously that Ranger Creed is being, you know, embedded into the candidates, the Ranger School candidates' head as well. The Ranger Regiment differs from an expectation that you can graduate Ranger School and stop living the Ranger Creed. It'd be simple. You just go to your normal organization, flaunt the tab around, and, and really not give back or meet the expectations that the Army, from a leadership perspective, is kind of... Uh, uh, expecting you to kind of bring to your organization. Uh, the Range Regiment differs that every day, uh, 365 days, you know, a year, on and off duty, the expectation is you're living the creed. And, you know, initially, you know, I used to say it all the time, it's word memorization. So back to that, you know, Ranger indoctrination program and them making us learn the Ranger creed in our history. Initially, it was words. And maybe it was two years, maybe it was three years, maybe it was four years. But at a certain point, uh, you're living the Ranger Creed. You know, so when it says, my courtesy to superior officers, neatness of dress and care of equipment, shall set the energy, shall set the example for others to follow. You know, readily will I display the intestinal fortitude. And I could go on and on and on with the stances of the, of the Ranger Creed. You know, and maybe one initially hits you faster than others. In other words, I don't, I don't think you learn it from a, you know, R-A-N-G-E-R. -E you don't at least start living it that way. There will be certain portions of that Ranger Creed at different periods of time that start, you know, they're embedded into you. And you truly start 
living it. It's like the army values, you know, so we're all taught, you know, from a soldierization process perspective, you know, you were all taught the acronym leadership and loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. But to young service members, men and women, those are just words. You know, they've got to be trained and, and until you train them each and every day, um, they will be just words. So, um, and I, so, I, but you know, back to the Ranger Creed, I think that is the big difference between the school and the regiment is in the regiment is that Ranger Creed, you know, you've got leaders, you know, 365 days a year that are making sure that you're living it um, each and every single day, that you're being that role model that you're supposed to be. Uh, whereas the school, um, you can stop living it. Now, with that being said, I've known tremendous leaders throughout the United States Army that have never served a day inside the regiment, inside the Ranger Regiment. Simultaneously, I've also known some, not many, but some that have served inside the Ranger Regiment that were not good Rangers. And in my opinion, uh, the difference between both of them um, was buying off in the Ranger Creed. So that commissioned officer or officer out in the regular army who's never served in the regiment, he or she has read that Ranger Creed and it's become, you know, kind of um, the rules in which they live each and every single day. And simultaneously, you can get a young man or woman into the Ranger Regiment that memorizes those words, yet he or she doesn't, haven't necessarily bought off on them. So, uh, you know, anyway, I believe that is the difference between the two. Commander Sergeant Major Fortenberry up at Fort Drum, recently graduated Ranger School as a CSM, saying in a story that he, he, it's hard for him to look down at his junior leaders and COs and officers and tell them they need to go to a leadership school that he had not attended. What's your thoughts on uh, a, a, someone of that senior rank going to school yeah. like that and any one of that? My, my thoughts on, on a recent graduate of uh, Command Sergeant Major Fortenberry, who uh, I think he's a Brigade Sergeant Major in 2nd Brigade uh, of the 10th Mountain Division. Um, I saw this post on Facebook about him uh, recently graduating the Ranger School. I friended him and threw out the comment. And my, and my comment was words to the effect of, you are a tremendous role model. Uh, for, for certainly your soldiers, everybody assigned the 2nd Brigade Combat Team, 10th Mountain Division, but just as importantly, and maybe more importantly, everybody across the United States Army. Um, they, you know, they teach us as an infantryman, they define an Army professional as, as being that uh, man or woman of character, uh, commitment, and competence who uh, from a leader development perspective, your training, education, and experience kind of defines you. And as an infantry professional, if you're truly that man or woman of competence, uh, one of those things that you've got to do is go to, go to ranger school, in my opinion. Um, you know, it, uh, it's set on the career maps for infantry uh, personnel to go. And for Sergeant Major Fortenberry to understand that he had not gone, you know, for whatever reason, deployments, uh, in the wrong duty position, his chain of command not supporting. I mean, there's a multitude of reasons that he hadn't gone up to this point. But re regardless, he identified the need and necessity to, to go. I wrote in a, po in a post that I believe that if you're leading America's sons or daughters and you're an infantry leader, you've got to do everything within your power to become the best leader you can be. And in my opinion, Ranger School is part of that. If I know, and, and I think, by the way, I think the moms and dads, the husbands and wives um, of those that we lead have an expectation of us as leaders to be the most competent that we can be, to do everything in a training environment to prepare ourselves uh, for the rigors of what we're going to experience um, in a combat situation, be it, you know, be it Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, or other, you know, locations globally. I think Sergeant Major Fortenberry just ensured that as a leader, he's doing everything within his power to be the best leader that he possibly can be uh, for his soldiers. And as a father, by the way, I've got a 25-year-old son who's a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. I hope my son's leaders 
do the same thing Sergeant Major Fortenberry has done if they are not Ranger qualified. And I don't care what grade. You never become too old to go to Ranger school. You never become too old to become better, uh, to better yourself in, you know, any one of those uh, domains, the operational, the institutional, or the self-development domain. Uh, you're never too old. And I think that's what Sergeant Major Fortenberry did. I'm so proud of him. Um, being a sergeant major at that level, he clearly did it for all the right reasons. And uh, I don't think he's going to have that regret when he retires to say, I wish I would have. I wish I would have done. I've got one regret over the course of, you know, however many years. And that is that I didn't attend the United States Army Ranger School to become the best leader that I possibly could. And I think uh, Sergeant Major Fortenberry is an example for all in the United States Army that you're never too old or you're never in that position uh, which doesn't allow you. And one other thing about him is he didn't take shortcuts and it was kind of highlighted in the article that you know he went to pre-ranger and he did the things that his younger soldiers would be required to do. Um, he could have easily as a brigade sergeant major used his past experiences as a shortcut to get to ranger school without attending the pre-ranger course and uh, he, he didn't do that. So. I'm extremely proud of him. I hope everybody in the in the United States Army that reads this and others that read this article are inspired the same way that I was. You've held a lot of positions, leadership positions in and out of uh, regiment, out in the conventional side, and also we'll get to your senior leader uh, positions here in a little bit. But what's the difference in your leadership style, whether you serve in regiment or in the conventional forces? Was there a change? Yeah. Uh, was there a change in my leadership styles, you know, after serving in, uh, in a ranger battalion? Um, certainly there was because I had role models. I had those, you know, those leaders that I was looking up and, and trying to emulate. You know, as a young private, it was Sergeant Major Leon Guerrero who, you know, kind of epitomized the quiet professional. And I, and I think, you know, if I've learned anything over serving in two Ranger battalions, you know, eight plus years of experience internal to those organizations, it was, you know, the best leaders that I saw. Uh, Sergeant Major Craig Bishop, the current regimental Sergeant Major, is a prime example of this, the quiet professionalism that we expect in, in our leaders. What I really learned in the Ranger Regiment, and this was starting in the 19, you know, 80s, today we got this modern day, uh, you know, saying or its doctrine inside the United States Army about mission command. And mission command is this idea that you empower your subordinate leaders you genuinely trust them. It's not trust just in words, but it's trust in your deeds and your actions. And, and that's what makes the regiment different. In, in conventional forces around the Army, I think uh, what you saw was bins. And it was a bin of commission officers. Today we call them the cohorts. The, the cohort or the bin of the commission officers in one bin. And another bin were the non-commission officers. And another bin were your enlisted soldiers. And another bin were your uh, great civilian, uh, civilian counterparts, whether GS and or contractors. Uh, but there were expectations. And the commission officers made all the decisions. Um, and non-commission officers just executed uh, based off what the commission officers were doing. And then certain from a soldier perspective, those young men or women, you know, they weren't allowed to think. They just, you know, they executed the drills based off what their non-commissioned officers told them to do. The difference in the Ranger Regiment was your leaders empowered you, and they expected non-commissioned officers to think. You know, we call it disciplined initiative today. You know, that's the way they define it in under mission command. It's just not initiative. It's disciplined initiative. It's those things that, you know, your training, your education, and your experiences up to that point had driven you to kind of, for lack of a better term, the military solution. Well, in the Ranger Regiment, even in the 80s, even in the early 90s, commission officers were doing this. So I, you know, I was raised in an environment or wow, man, uh, non-commissioned officers, you were part of the solution. I mean, you were in those discussions every day about how do we make this organization better? How do we better prepare them for combat? So if that day should arise, wow, you know, our ability to keep our young men and women alive 
you know, it's there. So, um, you know, and as I progressed through the Army, you know, and I hit the regiment again in, in 2000 and 1st Ranger Battalion, now this idea of mission command, and it had been identified in the United States Army, you, you know, a shared understanding, disciplined initiative, um, you know, and all these tenets or principles of mission command, they're starting to execute them in the big Army out of necessity and really, you know, after 9-11, that was kind of a driving force of really empowering. But the Ranger Regiment was at, you know, full bore. They're trusting and doing squad operations where you're putting staff sergeants in charge. Um, and really up to that point, I don't, I don't think, you know, the conventional army was just learning. They're better today and they're better because of things like Ranger School and building a capability and a capacity amongst your junior leaders, what regardless of the bin, whether it's an officer, a non-commissioned officer, a warrant officer, um, but there's still some work to be done and Rangers will continue to lead the way. So, that, I mean, that's a great tie into my next question here. So, you know, after you left the regiment, you held uh, some pretty big positions as Command Sergeant Major at the 10th Mountain Division. Forces Command, as well as CENTCOM. So maybe you couldn't implement those changes, but what from your Ranger background did you take with you and implement into those positions and around not just soldiers, but then later on those joint commands, those other service members? What, what were some of your experience? What, what was your background and training that you brought to those key positions? I think what made me successful in other positions outside the regiment as I continued to progress was um, you know, back to this idea of mission command and how do I help, uh, you know, my commander, and it didn't matter whether that commander was, you know, I'm going to say platoon commander, but platoon leader. It didn't matter whether it was a company commander, battalion commander, brigade commander, and or working for general officers at all levels. The idea as a non-commissioned officer is that you're assisting your commander uh, to ensure that the command is successful in its mission. And, uh, you know, I think the driving force at all levels, I think what made me successful is, is you know, what I learned in the Ranger Regiment. And that was, um, you know, to understand uh, those steps that we've got to take in order to be successful. But I had the ability to communicate with my commanders, and it didn't matter whether that commander was a lieutenant or a four-star general, my ability to provide input and be part of the solution um, was taken. And, and by the way, I think, you know, that's not only what has made me successful, but if you look at other, you know, Ranger non-commissioned officers that have been extremely successful out there making a difference, not only internal to the Department of the Army, but Department of Defense, you got Sergeant Major retired Darren Bond. You got Command Sergeant Major Rick Merritt, who's still out there in the regiment. You've got Command Sergeant Major Scott Schroeder at Forcecom, one of my previous jobs. Command Sergeant Major Dave Turnbull out of CAC. And I could go on and on and on. And these are all leaders that were touched by the Ranger Regiment. These were all leaders that their, their opinions and their thoughts and their ideas were valued by commanders. Why? Because they did everything within their power each and every day to become better leaders. And, um, you know, I think that's the takeaway from, from Regiment was our opinions mattered. And they continue to matter, you know, outside of, of the Ranger Regiment. And, uh, um, you know, I'm extremely proud of my service. I was at a senior leader conference up at, uh, up at West Point, and the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Odierno, was talking about assignments that had developed people. You know, and he turned around and he's talking to the collective, you know, the assembled audience, which was, you know, general officers at the two, three, and four-star level, and their command sergeant's major. And, you know, something clicked as he was looking at the assembled group, and he said, my goodness, look at how many of the sergeants